Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Why don't you give the Lord a great hand clap of praise right now? <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. And I like what I feel already for the service even again. I believe somebody came praying this Sunday morning. Amen. We're glad you're here, those who joined us online. But what's my saying? I feel like something good is about to happen. How many came with expectancy this Sunday morning? How many came with a need this morning? Let me tell you, we serve a God that can supply all your needs. Because better is one day in His house than a thousand elsewhere.
are you happy to be in the service tonight? This morning, it ain't tonight yet. <laughs> I'm getting ready. Amen. But he is here. Amen. We have felt his presence already in these first two songs. Hallelujah. But I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about some empty noise. Empty noise is described as a sound that is lacking content that could or should be present. And young be seated. I'm about to read a few verses of scripture. But thank you all for standing. First Samuel chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. It says, And when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so that the earth rang again. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that in the ark, and they understood that the ark of the Lord was come into the camp. Amen. The presence of God came into the camp and they gave a shout. Amen. We have come into this church and there's a presence. God's presence has come into this church and we have been given some shouts. Amen. But if we in this chapter here we find that the Philistines and the Israelites were at war with each other. And in the first battle the Philistines won. And so Israel decided, let's go get the presence of God. Let's go put him with our army. And that's what the Philistines heard in verses 5 and 6. But things had not always been done correctly and properly in the house of God, especially by Eli's sons. And in chapter 2, Eli tells us that they are causing the people of God to transgress. And in chapter 3, it says the word of God was rare in that day. And if we read on in verse 11, the battle was lost and the ark of God was taken and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. I come to tell somebody this morning that just because we are at church and just because the presence of God is here all around us doesn't mean that our battles will be won. Y'all stick with me. Just because we clap our hands with the praise team, just because we raise our hands every so often, just because we say amen when everybody else does to the preacher, it's not going to do much because it, also, it is not inside of us. We're giving off empty noise. This morning, if you've got need, this morning, if you've got some battles that need to be won, being here is step one. And I congratulate you for that because you are in the right place. But let's just not take up space and just put off some empty noise. Uh, let us pour ourselves out to God uh, so we can fill us up with His Spirit, amen, with His praise, with His worship, with His glory, with His honor, with His power inside of us. And when that gets inside of us, that's when our battles will be won. In Joshua chapter 6, the walls of Jericho did not fall down that seventh time around just because they showed up to participate. Amen. That shout that they gave was not empty. It was full of obedience. It was full of faith and it was full of triumph. So this morning let's soak up all we can today and let's worship in spirit and in truth so that when we leave here the walls of our hearts just like Jericho are going to fall. The walls of this church just like Jericho are going to fall and that way the presence of God will flow out into our community and flow out to everywhere we be. Praise Him if you will. There should not be any empty praise in the house of God if He's ever done anything for you. I said if He's ever done anything for you, you ought to praise Him. I want to take prayer requests. I'm going to do a few prayer requests. We're going to receive an offering this morning. Brother Steve Goldman, it's so good to see you this Sunday morning. Can I tell you that's a miracle that's working right now? And I'm looking for greater things for Brother Steve. Uh, Michelle Floyd's going to be having surgery this week. Be praying for her. Ryder, which is memory time, his grandson, he is feeling he's, he was sick the last two weeks. There's a lot of needs that I've got listed here. Let's pray for our pastor and his wife on vacation. And they need that vacation. And let's pray for them a safe return. I'm excited when he gets back. Lord, we're in revival right now, and I'm looking for greater things, more miracles, if you will, happening. 
But today the Lord's already here. It's already been said. And he can do anything. That's a capital A. Anything that you need. If you've got a need, would you stand to your feet right now? And how can you stand on without your feet? Why don't you just look around you? Y'all see the needs that's around? How many has enough faith saying, I know God's able to take care of these needs? Would you stand with us together right now? Let's agree together. God's going to meet needs right now. Would you lift your hands? Would you lift your voices? Oh, Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you so much for the privilege we have to be here this morning. And, Lord, we thank you right now for the mighty presence we feel of your Spirit here. God, you saw the needs that were standing and those that's agreeing. Thank you, Lord. I pray that you touch each and every one of them. And let our praise not be empty. But, God, use us the vessels unto you, your honor and glory. And, God, we pray for a greater revival. And, Lord, as we see this offering this morning, I pray, Lord, right now that you re- you bless the gift, bless the giver equally in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Amen. Worship with them and they bless us in song. I'm thankful that no matter where God leads me and no matter how many times that I fail, he is right there when I call on his name. Out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail, and there I find you in the mystery, in ocean deep, my faith will.
Aren't you glad he calls you friend? Aren't you glad he's a God that's here with us? Remain standing if you will. I want to bring our Gideon International speaker. Her name is James Moffat. Would you make him welcome as he comes and shares his thoughts? I will say this. He's got to have a pretty good wife. She was a Wallace before she married him. <laughs> she just can't spell her name. Well, regardless of the spelling, I got a really good wife. And I'm glad she's here with me today. What a thrill it is to be here with you in this beautiful house of the Lord to worship Him. I am a Gideon. I'm right proud of that. My name is James Moffat. My wife's name is Kay. She is a what? I am. And uh, listen, I hear it several times. I was raised in an all corn farm. Back in those days, to make a living, you had to leave North Mississippi. Y'all don't remember that. Y'all are all too young to remember those days. We were born in 1940. You'll be mad at me for telling y'all how old she is. I'm kind of proud of it. <laughs> but uh, we've had good lives. We've, uh, part of that is we've always been able to find a good church home wherever we've been. And uh, we were so lucky. Uh, a lot of times I feel sorry for people who don't know that. Uh, and so we're still relatively healthy, walking around at age, age 82. Uh got some artificial joints, but they work pretty well. <laughs> it is really good to be here with you. Now, uh, we're all Christians. Christians. Think about that. What does that mean? That means that we believe in, subscribe to, and do the best we can to follow the teachings of who? Christ. Jesus Christ, of course. And he, it, he didn't leave anything uh, unclear about what he expects of us. If you'll turn over there. Oh, by the way, this is the Word of God. Uh, written by men, of course. That's how God works. He works through you and me. Men and women. Uh, there have been times when he apparently, in his recorded year, not apparently, when he did perform all kinds of miracles, unbelievable things. Can you consider? No, you can't consider of the kind of power. Think about the power of your God, your God, my God, the God. The power that can create everything you know. Create the universe just by willing it into existence. Now think about that. He invites it. Let there be. And it becomes just that. Now, there's no way our minds can conceive of such power as that. There's no way our minds can conceive of the rest of someone who would give his only son to hang on a cross after suffering all sorts of humiliation. Now, that's a powerful God. That is a loving God. There is no such love as that that we've ever known. Except we know about that one. And it's reported to us right here in this word. Now, if uh, you probably know this by heart, the last three or four verses in Matthew, in the very first chapter, say this. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, 
teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you. even unto the end of the world. Amen. The Word of God for the people of God is this day in the message. Gideon, uh, or not uh, completely Gideon, as in this particular denomination, as you know, we come from Pentecost, and Presbyterian, Baptist, Methodist. Anybody who believes in Jesus Christ as Lord can be a Gideon. Um, and we base our entire existence on that scripture you just read. Our method of taking the message, the gospel to the world, is by providing copies of the printed word wherever we can, in as many places to as many people as we possibly can. We do pretty good. Uh, we were up to about. 92 million copies of the gospel a year when the pandemic hit. It might hurt us like it hurts a lot of people, but we're back up to about 92 million a year. Uh, yeah, those scriptures go to, we have active printing, active Gideon edits in about 200 countries, possessions, and provinces. Um, that's pretty nice stuff. Uh, we we distribute Bibles in about a hundred different languages uh, around the world. We believe that the Holy Spirit, you know, you know, that the Holy Spirit works to cause people to read those Bibles. Now, you know, we don't, there's no way you can force anybody to read the Bible. You put Bible in a motel room, you don't know that anybody's going to read it, but they do. They do. Some do. You know, not everybody does, but some be faithful. You know. Some take them with them, and that's, that's fine. We don't mind that. You may not know this, but Gideon placed those Bibles in those motel rooms. I mean, personally, sure, Gideon. They're not put in there by Naomi. They're put in there by Gideon. And Gideons go back and check them. Now, they're supposed to do it twice a year. We don't quite make that as a point. I don't know about you. It's a dangerous point, but uh, we, make it, we try to just make it at least once a year. And we look at every one of those boxes. And if they're torn pages, or if things are marked out, up. If it's got something on it that's sweaty, then we have to get the got water on it. Or, but you know, in any way we face it, we face it very simply. Put them in. We face it with a brand new. And then we use those old ones. We take the backs off. You know, don't let them try to see the weapon with the backs off. But you know, we get them in prison for various. Well, we try to we try to get 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 in these full size Bibles in motels, hotels. This is what we call the traffic lane for the waiting room. Uh, you know, you can get these little testaments. A lot of times, you can just read out of this one and it's got a, in connection with personal testimony. But systematically, we we get them to fifth graders in school. We distribute them on uh, junior college and college college. Right here at Northeast, we had a, well, last year, we went over there as usual. Usually we do it in, I think it's after the summer anyway, isn't it? And uh, we went over there with a bunch of boxes of testaments. And there wasn't anybody there. But, <laughs> but us, <laughs> we're standing around looking at one another. And what had happened was, on the count of the pandemic, they'd gone to all, you know, classes were all on the computer. Now, that's done. I, I practiced law for about 40 years, and, and we had, I started practicing the only way you had to make a copy. You couldn't type, copy anything already in the 
suggestion for this new emotional test of you. <laughs> you can do it. You can do it. About five, up to five, no more than five. Then you stand from Harvey. And you hit that old magnet kind of <laughs> tight right as just as hard as you could, and you can make about five stops. And now you know you can stop the most thing in the world. Computers and these word processes just spit out a word and you type it all you want. And that's the way. But I've had tests with my old body. But uh, anyway, they had all gone to home line. We'll have them this year. Usually we have about 700 at the whole thing. And we'll have distributions at the other community colleges and all that kind of stuff. And we started giving them to graduating seniors and all that kind of stuff. It's a good time when they're all together when they're rehearsing. We arrange, uh, give them all the New Testament church of the Octet church for each other. And we give them. Uh, all members of the armed forces. Now those are even in camouflage. Some few teenagers, especially little girls, for some reason like to get their hands on those camouflage tests. But we have them in white for nursing students. Uh, we have distributions for the nursing students. Uh, we put them in boxes. By the way, our wives and women are getting more and more active in helping us in our work. And they uh, they put up, they give them distributions in the doctor's offices and all kinds of things like they have all together here. They, they do some of the distributions and we do some together. In fact, nursing homes, we usually go in husband and wife team. And we, we get around to doing the right thing sooner or later. We have to have some, some larger tents for the older people. can to spread God's word. We'll have a distribution at the fair. Some of y'all may not realize that, but at least in Alton County, we'll have a tent set up at the fair. And we invite them over. That's good. We can do that. That's a good thing. And I'm, uh, this isn't real fun. But I will say that we regard local congregations as our heart in everything we do. We love that because of your voluntary offer, contribution to the work. We don't have cakewalks. We don't have bingos. We don't have any gimmicks to raise money. We just ask you, like I'm here to do today, to help us in this mission to carry out that great homework, putting God's Word in as many places and in as many hands and as many regions we can as possible. Is always to win souls for Christ. And that's what we're all about, isn't it? Now, this is a good way. It's an effective way. Testimonies come back to video headquarters from all over the world, from all kinds of people, about how that God has benefited them. And I don't understand how that works. You know, but I know the God you serve, and the God I serve, can do it. He can use that Bible or that Old Testament and change a life. And he does. So I don't know why we'd be asked to put money in the tent. And we use that tent. You know what I tell you? For every dollar that comes from local congregations to Gideon is used to either buy the Bible or ship it. That's it. Buying and shipping Bible is what that money was used for. All our, we have an office that sits right up the road here at Nashville. She would be glad to see you up there at the headquarters if you care to drop in any time. And we have full-time employees that help some trade. And we, you know, all overhead is huge for doing organizations. You know. But we handle that. Congregations constitute about 25% of the total money we handle. The rest of it comes from us through our faith base, through our deeds, and so forth. So you may.
say that's security, but any money we can put in be used to either buy or to ship Bibles. We don't print them. We, but we, we can get them for $5 a piece. For $5 a piece, we can get this. Well, that's pretty good price for Bibles. You know, we can put them here for you. That's a very good price. And uh, we can get that thing that cost $5 a piece. Thank you for having me. They asked me to be sure you can put this on the back. You, you may know about our card program. Uh, if you don't, I'll, I'll discuss it with you as we serve. I'm going to take up too much time. We have card programs now, and they're free. What we do is cards, all actually two cards in one. One goes to the person you want to send a card to. And it has a nice uh, greeting in it. Uh, maybe a Bible verse, or maybe a word or something else for a person to tell them how to feel. We start pretty quick. But inside it is another card, for which, and that goes to the good local vending company. And for five dollars a piece, you can print as many of these Bibles as you like. Five dollars each. In that person's honor. For him, in case it's not. Uh, that's a nice way to remember people. Uh, it's much more effective than flowers, and it lasts a lot longer. What else do I need to do for people? One more thing. We need giving. And God says we need it. So, you let me know, you give me your name before I leave here today. You're interested in being a giver. Uh, that's a good thing to do. There's a lot of satisfaction that comes out of knowing you help send God's word out there. Maybe to the other side of the earth. Uh, and yeah, that's an effective thing to do. It's a good thing to do. So, if, you, if you're interested in that kind of work, we meet every Saturday morning for prayer. Not everybody, not all Gideons here want to stand up and thank you so much for doing like I'm doing this morning. I talk about how great a crowd we have. I wish we could have more time to discuss that, but I'm just going to throw it away as I can tell you are. And it's so good to be in a worship service that's full of life. Life. That's, that's what it's all about. Just love to God. Christianity is a religion of action. Okay, thank you. When the church comes around, if you see a move, uh, we'll see if we'll entertain you. But that's okay. Thank you. I've been asked if Sister Catherine to say something. She's on her way out here. Uh, Mr. Moffat here. And I'm going to tell you, the Bible says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. When I go to the, a lot of times the motel, I grab it, I open it up to it, Psalms usually, and put it on the bed. I just want to say a little something. When Bobby lost his son in February, uh, there were churches that, and there were people in this church, that donated Gideon Bibles in his memory. And we so appreciated that. And that would have meant so much to him more than anybody sending flowers or anything. So anytime you have that need to do that, it, the family really appreciates it too because, you know, it's the Word of God going out to lots of people. And uh, we really appreciate that. I just wanted to say that it it is a good program. As the ushers are making their way to receive our offering uh, for the Gideons, I will say I still have my fifth grade testament. I still have my military testament. 
And I still have the one that was given to me, the white one. I didn't remember what it was. And I have kept it, and it means a lot to me. The Bible says, Study thou shall I self approve unto God, a workman need of not lightly by any word of truth. We need the word of God. We need the word of God. God, I love you. And I thank you for this offering I'm about to receive. And I ask you to bless these as they give the further your gospel. Bless them that doesn't have it likewise but wish to. And we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. How many of knows there's a new name written in heaven when you got the Holy Ghost? How many of knows with a new name in heaven when you give yourself the Lord? Would you stand right now? They bless us in song.
today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, can we just give the Lord a hand clap of praise right now? Oh, come on, I think he deserves a little better than that. There is a new name, and it's mine. Hallelujah. My, 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 I just love what I feel in the house of the Lord this morning. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I don't want to waste any time. I, I want to move right on into what God's got planned for this service. If we could all stand together right now, I'm going to be going to 1 Kings chapter 18, verse number 45. Thank you all for being here today, those that are joining us online. Thank you, Brother Soden, for this opportunity. I do not take this lightly. Um, I echo Brother Wallace. We do miss the Sodens when they're gone, but this is a well-deserved, much-needed vacation. Amen. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse number 45, it says, And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain, and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. For the next few moments, I want to take just a little bit of time to preach to you on the thought, In the Meanwhile. You may be seated. And it came to pass in the meanwhile. This is probably a pretty familiar passage of Scripture to most of us here, but bear with me while I lay a little groundwork and try to make sense out of all this. At the beginning of chapter 18, Elijah travels to Samaria at the urging of the word of the Lord to see Ahab. At this time, there's also a great famine in Samaria. Fast forward just a little bit, um, and we have where Elijah challenges the 450 prophets of Baal. Uh, this is at Jezebel's doing. She um, killed what prophets of the Lord she could. Obadiah had his part in hiding, I think, about 100 prophets. Um, but Elijah gets a little bold in his spirit, and he says, all right, there's 450 of you versus one of me. And he says, whichever God answers with fire, let him be God. Let him be the God. And we know that the prophets of Baal, they, they took their bullock and they, they did their thing. They cut, cut their pieces and, uh, you know, they would, they would cry out to Baal and nothing would happen. No answer. So Elijah thought it was funny. He said, you know, scream a little louder. Maybe he's asleep. Maybe he can't hear you. He's on a journey somewhere. Just, just keep hollering. He'll hear you. We know that the prophets of Baal, they even began to cut themselves. and They just, we'd probably call, call the law watching somebody do that around here. I would anyway. So after, after an amount of time, after the show, the, the screaming, the hollering, the cutting, the, whatever ritual thing that the prophets of Baal were doing didn't work, it was Elijah's turn. And it mentions that Elijah rebuilt the altar. He prepared his offering and doused the entire thing in water. Um, and maybe we need to rebuild some altars in our life. This is not the, the meat of my message, but I, I just feel to linger here for a minute that, that, that there are some altars in our life, places of sacrifice that need to be rebuilt. And this is a good morning to do that. But, but he, had, he had the whole thing doused in water. They, they, they poured water on it from the bucket three times. And Elijah called out to the Lord and fire fell from heaven that consumed everything. It consumed the the offering it consumed the 12 stones that Elijah had put together. It even licked up the dust and the water that was around it. And I don't know if you know too much about putting out fires, but Brother Wallace can back me up on this, that most fires can be put out with water. Most. Not all, but most. 
but a fire so hot that the very thing that would combat it was licked up at the same time that everything else was. After Elijah had established that God, the God that we serve, the God that we we pray to, the Almighty God, was the one true God, he had all 450 prophets of Baal killed. Elijah understood that if there was going to be progression, that he had to kill some of the old things, some of the old ways of life. He had to do away with some old connections and some old relationships, some old friendships. He had to do away with the old lifestyle completely. So he had all 450 prophets killed. And I think that that sometimes is what hangs us up the most. And we're so on fire for God. And then we go see that one person that just knows how to make us throw it all away. I believe this morning that we need to kill some things in our lives. Some don't, don't go kill nobody. Now, I'm not telling you or giving you permission but I'm saying you need to make some disconnects from old old habits, old ways, old, old relationships in your life. And this brings us a little more into my message right here. Uh, 1 Kings 18, 41 through 44, it says, And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat, and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. And Ahab went up to eat and to drink. And Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. And he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up. And he looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, Go up, say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. These four verses give us the formula that we are supposed to follow in the meanwhile, in the waiting period, in the time between. Verse number 41 is the delivery of the promise. Elijah told Ahab, he said, Get up. Eat and drink. I know it's a famine. I know that supplies are limited. I know that that food may not be in abundance right now. But go ahead and eat and drink, for there is the sound of an abundance of rain. The promise was given. Verse number 42, the second step of, of the formula. Trusting what God says. And after a promise is given, pray and seek after God. It said, so Ahab went to eat and drink. He did it. He trusted what the prophet of God was telling, what the man of God had told him. He trusted that the rain was on its way. Because, for example, inflation, it's hit us all pretty hard. And if I was to tell you, hey, go ahead and spend, go ahead and spend that $300 on, on groceries this week it, because I, inflation's on its way down. It, it's going to be all right. You're going to be able to recoup every bit of that. You all would look at me about like you're looking at me right now, like I'm crazy. And so in the middle of a famine, I can only imagine Ahab's reluctancy to go ahead and eat and drink. What if there's not enough to go around, but he trusted the Word of God. And Elijah prayed, and he sought after God. We don't just receive the promise and then just sit around and, that's going to be it. God's going to do it. That's the end of it. He thought he said it, and I ain't got to do nothing else about it. But we have to pray. We have to seek. We have to, 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 to chase after God. Verse number 43, anticipate your promise at any given time. He said, and his servant, go up now and look toward the sea. And he went and looked. He said, there's nothing. He said, go again seven times. Just because the promise didn't come the first time that he went to look, doesn't mean you quit anticipating the promise. That's why he told him to go seven times. Oh, come on. I, I, I feel the Holy Ghost in this place right now. It's too many times we've been given a word from God. We've been given a promise from God. And, and we look to the horizon and, God, it ain't there. He says, well, keep looking. Just keep Keep looking for the promise. And, oh, God, it's not there. It wasn't there the first time or the second time. I, I just don't think it's going to happen. 
Can you imagine if the servant had just sat down after three or four times of looking for the cloud? The promise may not have ever even came. In verse number 44, be obedient while you wait. And it came to pass at the seventh time. The last time he told him to go and look, it was there. It says in a little cloud out of the sea. Now around here, we can tell. You look at the sky... And you can tell how bad it's going to rain. Mm, it's looking dark out there towards South Pillow. We got a big one coming in from the south. And ten minutes later, the bottom falls out, and we might have to get the life jacket. But a small cloud, that wouldn't mean anything to us. That, that would just be another day in, in Mississippi. But whenever you haven't seen a cloud in so, in so long, when you haven't, there hasn't been any evidence that there's going to be any rain, that gets you excited. Whenever you can see your promise on the horizon, and you can see it on its way, there's just something that boils up on the inside of you. It says, oh yes, I see my promise and it's coming. It's on its way. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Going back to our scripture text in verse 45, it says, And it came to pass in the meanwhile. It came to pass while he was waiting. It came to pass in between. It came to pass... In the meanwhile, while that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. It came to pass while he was waiting. What, church, let, let, me, let me tell you, what you do while you wait matters. How you wait matters. It came to pass in the meanwhile. It came to pass while he was waiting obediently. You know, I, it's like a like a jack in the box. Anybody ever played with a jack in the box? And you anticipating, you waiting on that thing to pop out. And it and it should have popped. And then all of a sudden, that thing pops up out of that box and you jump and throw the thing across the room. And But if you think about that, in reality, that's how the promises of God are. You're waiting and you're waiting and you're waiting and you're waiting. And just when you're on the verge of giving up, all of a sudden, boom, out of nowhere. This is where we mess up. You ever been in a service? It's on fire. Holy Ghost is moving. And uh, the preacher or uh, somebody you respect very well, uh, a great man of God, they come up to you and they say, this is what the Lord told me to tell you. And you get this word from God and you get this promise and you're so full of fire and so full of passion you're so full of desire. You're, you're, you're just, you're amped up and you're ready to go. Because you just received a word from God. You just received a, a promise on something that you didn't even think was coming for, that may not ever come. And so you wait. And you wait. And you wait. And you wait a little bit more. And somewhere along the, the waiting, you develop the timeline. You develop the moment when you thought God was going to deliver this promise. Oh, it'll, six months. 
Oh, it's a good, good coming in six months. Just wait, watch, and see. I'm so full of faith. Uh, my faith can't be wavered. It'll be here in six months. We're upset in things by me. I uh, still haven't done anything. It hasn't come to pass yet because we've set a, a timeline. We, we put it on the schedule instead of letting God put it on the schedule. And so many times, because we failed in the wait, the spiritual high just crashes. We go into maybe a state of depression. God, that wasn't really from God. That, he just, he just blowing smoke. He, he just, it ain't ever going to happen. It ain't ever going to come to pass. It's just, and we lose faith and we lose hope and, and, and we, we, don't, we don't have a desire anymore. We don't have fire anymore. We don't have passion anymore. And so we just sit on a church pew and, and just right away we have, uh, we have an empty voice, Brother Tyler, and, and it just, we expect God to just drop everything on us right now, right immediately because our world has, has developed, conditioned us to instant gratification and we've allowed that mentality to bleed over into our walk with God I, I can tell you right now that if you'll take the schedule off God and, and you'll just begin to trust Him through everything no matter how long it seems to take it, if you'll just take the schedules off of God, just watch and see watch and see what God will do there's a process the weight is our testing ground because if you can't be faithful in the wait, you can't be faithful with the promise. It's that old, well, it's not old, but that commercial. It's my money, I, I want it now. It's my promise, I want it now. Too many times we receive a word or a promise from God and we're so excited about it for about a week. And then we just give up. I, can I tell you that I, I have a beautiful little girl right now that we were prophesied to over three years ago? Do you do you think I would have? Do you think I'd have my promise if I'd have just give up in the wait? I'm telling you, God is still delivering miracles right now. Hey, God is still pouring out blessings right now. You just got to be faithful in the meanwhile. how you respond in the meanwhile that would determine the outcome of your promise. You say, well, God, God said it. God's word never returns void. And that's correct. It's just almost like a promise. It's just floating out there. Well, while you've given up, while you're just sitting there and letting the, the, the Lord move by you, you're just idle. Uh, you're on autopilot just moving through life. Your promise is just floating out there. Just waiting on you to be ready. Jesus Christ. Where it never does return void. Never returns void. It's out there. It's waiting on you. That word from God is not dead. That, that promise that you received 10 years ago is not dead. God, God has not given up on you. That's why it never returns void. It's just, it's out there floating right around where you left Him. Right around where you walked away from God. And it's just right in that vicinity. Oh, come on. I, I wish somebody would get a hold of what I'm trying to tell you. Oh, thank you, Jesus. So how are you going to respond in the meanwhile? How are you going to respond whenever that doctor's visit doesn't go just the way that you thought it should? What are you, how are you going to respond in the meanwhile whenever that diagnosis wasn't what you were hoping for? What are you going to do when there's more months at the end of the money? How are you going to respond to the things that life throws at you? Life is so full of things that could so easily beset us, that could so easily knock us off this, this road that we're walking. If we are not in the right mindset, how we respond in the meanwhile matters. 
how we respond to that diagnosis, to that, to, to, to that terminal illness, how we respond to, the, to that empty bank account, how we respond to things going on, and how, how we respond to just watching everything around us crumble when that job fires you or lets you go this week. Or, or it matters how we respond. I know it can get overwhelming at times and and sometimes it would just be easier to throw in the towel. But today, church, I implore you, don't you give up in the meanwhile. The promise is just on the other side of the meanwhile. Elder of this church, I know our movement has been preaching the coming of the Lord is near for years and years and years. But you hold on a little while longer, Elder. You hold on a little while longer because as young people, we are watching you and we, we are watching how you handle life and, and what it throws at you. Uh, elder, I implore you, don't give up. I know you've been serving 30, 40, 50 or more, or more years, but don't you dare throw in the towel. Young adult, young person, middle age, whatever category you may fall into, don't you dare give up because I hear an abundance of rain. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I gotta hurry. Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. We've got to relearn how to wait on God. We've got to reteach ourselves that. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Second Peter chapter 3, verse number 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward, to usward. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. James 5, 7 through 8. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive er the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts. Make up in your mind. Set your foot on the rock. Don't be wavered. Don't give up so easily. For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Hallelujah, hallelujah. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to be just like Joshua and, and make up my mind right now, in this moment. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. In the meanwhile, Acts chapter 1, verse number 4, and then to verse 8, it says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. But ye shall, verse 8, but ye shall receive power after the, that, that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem uh, and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Acts 2 and 2, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting because they were willing to go to the upper room with 120 other men because they were willing to wait on the promise. They were able to partake in the greatest thing, the greatest miracle. If the music wants to go ahead and come. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. What happens in the meanwhile matters. Because if we respond incorrectly, then we will miss the promise. Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 through 13. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamp and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. And they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your oil, for our lamps are gone out. My, my, my. But the wise answered, saying, Not so. Lest there be not enough for us and you. 
but go you rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. How you respond in the meanwhile. When Jesus left, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. That's the promise. This is the meanwhile. Everything in between. And how you respond matters. The five foolish virgins weren't prepared in the meanwhile. And they missed the union of the bridegroom. How have you been responding in the meanwhile? We've been promised eternity, but how we respond in the meanwhile will determine where we spend eternity. Let's all stand. You have an opportunity this morning. No matter what you did leading up to the moment you walked in this door. You have an opportunity this morning to respond in the meanwhile. The way that God wants you to respond. We must repent. We must be baptized in Jesus' name and we must receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to open up these altars. And I urge you, I implore you that if, if the decisions that you have made coming up to this point, to this moment, have not been exactly what God would have wanted, if, they, if, they had, if it hasn't been uh, the way that, that God would want you to do, if maybe you said some things or did some things, went some places, maybe you shouldn't have went or shouldn't have said, or shouldn't have did. You have a moment right now in, th in this house, today, this morning. Oh, I I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost is stirring so heavily in this place right now. I, I want to open up these altars, and I want to give you an opportunity to respond in the meanwhile.